it's, it's my pleasure to introduce these uh, two uh, marvelous correspondents. Um, perhaps it's just the size you know, of the building that makes the prospect of covering the Pentagon uh, immediately, immediately overwhelming, uh, at least for me. Um, yet these two guys, uh, reporters, possess the unique ability to cut through a thicket of acronyms and, and penetrate the chain, chain of command to bring us extraordinary stories about the problems that commanders would rather bury and the courageous people who make the institution uh, what it is. Uh, just last week, um, Tom Bowman of NPR and Tom Vandenbroek of USA Today uh, broke important stories on the beat. You probably saw them. Bowman brought us a long withheld truth about the death of an Iraqi interpreter for the U US Marines operating in Fallujah, who was killed by friendly fire uh, that was never disclosed uh, publicly or to his family, uh, tragically. Uh, Vandenbroek, meanwhile, reported how Chinese nationals disguised as tourists have been suspected of spying at US military installations uh, in Alaska, a new wrinkle in the PRC's multifaceted espionage campaign against the US following the recent downing of the spy balloon. So without further ado, I will turn it over to the Toms uh, from, from the Pentagon, and then we'll open up the questions uh, shortly after. Tom and I have been covering the Pentagon for a long time, Tom even longer than I have. But um, I think we share kind of the same perspective in um, making sure that we don't just follow the daily bouncing ball so much as we try to look for stories that aren't covered. And Tom did that beautifully in his podcast on what happened with Friendly Fire. Because the Pentagon would have been delighted to have had that die without anybody knowing it happened. And those are the kind of stories that don't get told unless you've been on the beat for a long time and you know people and they're willing to speak to you because they trust you. And the only way you get to, the, to that point is by putting in lots of time, you know, spending time with sources, talking to people, and doing stories that matter so that they, they can trust you. And the only, and, and Tom is one of the best at that. I mean, he's dogged, he never lets up on people, and um, we need that. We need you guys to do that stuff. Um, I can't impress upon you enough the need for um, reporters at the Pentagon, all of the institutions in town, because there aren't enough of us. And there are stories, there are tons of stories out there that we're missing. There are stories that Tom and I are missing at the Pentagon because we don't have enough time and there are not enough reporters to do it. There's way too much hot air, way too much punditry, not enough people just getting out and talking to, in our case, troops, commanders, finding out what's really going on. And that's how we find our stories. Um, the story about spies in Alaska came because I was in Alaska reporting about suicide there. And there was a spate of suicides that the army didn't want to talk about at all. But the troops families wanted to talk about it and they reached out to me. And I had to pound on the army again and again to give me the figures. And then when the figures came out, they were horrible. You know, they had 17 suicides in Alaska among soldiers in 2021. You know, double the number in the previous couple of years. And people below the command level, the public affairs level, the spokesman level, they wanted to talk about it. And those are the people you need to get to. And they will tell you stuff, but you've got to listen and you've got to make the effort. So um, I'm not going to blather too much longer, but it's, that's, that's my theory of reporting. Just get out and look for stories others may not be doing. Don't always follow the bouncing ball. Look for, you know, look for stories that affect people, and um, you'll find readers that way, too. I once uh, talked with this guy from DIA. He was a, you know, he's a spy, Defense Intelligence Agency. We were having a cup of coffee, and he said, you know, we're in the same line of work. I said, whoa, whoa. No, no, you're a spy. I'm a reporter. He said, no, no, no. We seduce people. We get people to tell us things maybe they shouldn't. I do it to get people to betray their countries. You get it to tell people what's really going on. I said, wow, never thought of it that way, but he's right. We're only as good as our sources. 
You can sit in the White House briefing room. I don't recommend it. You can sit in the Pentagon briefing room. Nobody who stands there is going to tell you the truth. No one. I spent a lot of time doing this. And people would stand up and say, the Afghan army is in charge now. They're leading patrols. They're getting better every day. A week later, I'm over in Afghanistan at a combat outpost before dawn, talking to this, we're all of our Kevlar on and, and armor, talking to this uh, army sergeant. Afghan walks up, reeking of hash, no shirt on, says to the sergeant, can I get some milk? I'm not going to give any goddamn milk. Get back or you're going to be leading this patrol. You have to get out and see real people. Whether it's at the Pentagon, like Tom said, up in Alaska, if you cover politics, this is not a real city. This is a theme park. <laughs> and you better learn that now. And you can push a button. I know what Bernie Sanders is going to say. Push a button. I know what Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene is going to say, even before they open their mouths. Is that reporting? Anybody? Is that reporting? You're wasting your time by doing that. Find out what's really going on. And you only do that by sources. You can never have enough sources. And the great thing about the military is you can go places with them. Now, I'm sorry about the White House. It's your spoon-fed State Department. The nuance of what he said is different from what he said two weeks ago. How do I read that? I don't know. And the Hill, again, push a button, that person's going to say something. The debt limit. Do you think anybody gives a shit about that? How many stories did you see on the debt limit? Anybody? 15, 20, 50? And the result was what? What was it? <laughs> and anything in there of interest? So a guy over 49 years old who's getting food stamps has to actually work 20 hours a week, right? which is kind of an interesting story. Find those people, right? They're out there somewhere. Maybe there are not that many. And again, the great thing about the, the Pentagon is going overseas on someone else's dime. That's the best thing about our business. <laughs> Somebody's paying you to go someplace interesting. Spent a lot of time in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria. You know, they're training in, in Finland with the Finnish troops. Someone's going to pay you to go and watch this happen. Get in a boat and go into the South China Sea with the Philippines, Filipinos. It's the best beat in town, by far. But, and Tom's right, you, get a, you can't just sit there and be spoon-fed at the Pentagon or anywhere. What are they not saying? And talk to real people, again, with soldiers, Marines, whether they're political people, Get outside of the city and go talk to real people as much as you can. I think we've all lost that over the decades. I used to work at the Baltimore Sun with these guys, Jack Germond and Jules Whitcover. I think most people have no idea who they are anymore. They were never in the office. They were always out there talking to real people, union leaders, political leaders, small town mayors. They had a better sense of what's going on than most reporters, because they did not stay in Washington. How many people thought Hillary was going to win? Right? You know why? Because everyone's talking to one another in Washington. They weren't out there talking to real people. My wife works at New America. She used to work at the Washington Post. So she, was, she wrote a book called Overwhelmed, Balancing Work and Family. Please buy it. <laughs> she was giving a speech out in Wyoming where she has relatives and this is Wyoming and I just kind of went along for fun we went skiing at Jackson Hole had a great time so she's giving her speech and I'm in the coffee shop drinking coffee watching CNN this is the spring of 2016 there's this guy walking around you know picking up trash putting it away in a big bag and he points at Trump on the screen. He said, that's my guy. <laughs> this is when Trump was kind of a joke. I'm like, really? How come? He's going to build that wall. 
And he was, he was an African-American. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> that's kind of odd. If I was a political reporter, I would say, what is going on here? I mean, it was one guy in Wyoming, but what is going on here? That's why you get out and talk to real people. Hi, I'm Minnie. I work at Time Magazine. Um, I agree with you entirely. I really, it's really nice to hear you say this about talking to real people, about covering the important stories. I think uh, most of us would not choose to cover the debt limit, you know, if we had the choice. And sometimes these decisions are left to people above us. And sometimes we don't have the resources to go out into the country and talk to people. I'd love to hear your advice on how to handle that. Well, first off, I say we, we all have to do, we've got to pay the bills. We've got to shovel some coal, right? We've, we, Tom and I can say we don't have to cover daily stuff, but we do. We cover it occasionally. You know, we, we, when an F-16 has a sonic boom over Washington, we've got to say something about it, right? But that doesn't take all your time, right? And the debt limit stuff, you can do it, but always make sure that's not your primary focus. And as Tom said, there is a 49-year-old guy out there somewhere who's going to have to work for his, you know, uh, food stamps now. So find that guy. Figure out a way to do that. There's, there are ways you can talk to social service agencies that can put you in touch with people if you're confined to Washington, you know. But make sure you do it outside Washington, somewhere else. Maybe it's Wyoming. Maybe it's Wisconsin, wherever it is. But try to find, you know, perspectives that you don't hear, you know, around here. Thomas? I mean, you just call people, too. I mean, right? Small town mayor, medium sized mayor. I mean, one of the things I've always been, I was on January 6th, I was on the Hill. I covered that whole thing. I was also at the Pentagon on 9-11. The Hill thing was the second craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. But who are these people? I kept saying, they were crawling up the, the side of the walls of the, of the Capitol, it was insane. It was crazy. So who, who are these people? And there were some towns where they had like five buses from some small town in Tennessee. Who are these people? What's the story with this town? You, almost as an anthropologist, you could go to a town like that. Talk to the mayor, the newspaper editor, the city clerk. What happened to this town? And, you know, not in a condescending way, but just walk me through how you got five buses to go to the Capitol and attack the Capitol, right? So you can just reach out to people like that with, with um, you know, the, with the Pentagon, you know, one of the big issues now is recruiting. You can call a recruiting guy out in Texas or, you know, uh, are you having trouble recruiting women because of the reproductive rights issue? That I don't want to join the military if they're going to base me at Fort Hood. Well, it used to be Fort Hood. I'm, right. I'm not sure what they call it now. Cavazos. Cavazos. I'm not going to join the military if they're going to put me in Texas. Right? I mean, how is that affecting recruiting? See, there are all sorts of stories you can go by just picking up the phone and finding out who to call. It's always good to go because you want that scene, especially in my line of work. You really want that scene. I mean, you can call people all day long, but if you can. And also, work, you, some of you folks work with papers. You can, you, you can partner with your reporters back home. Go to a recruiting station in Sacramento. What are the recruiters hearing? Are they, the Army's having a hell of a time getting people to join. Part of it's the economy, but some of it is, you know, young women in particular don't want to join. I mean, what, what's going on out there? Always reach out if you, again, if you work at a paper or a magazine, particularly a paper, to your people back in the state or the city. What are they hearing out there about Washington? What are people interested in? I can guarantee it's not the debt limit, but there are other issues that you can jump on. And you have to reach out, again, to your newspaper, and, and again, we keep harping on this to real people. Sorry, press the button. Um, my name is Naomi. I'm with the Washington Examiner. I'm a White House reporter, which is a very famously generalistic. I was wondering, what is the biggest mistake you see White House reporters make about the Ukraine war and the coverage that we're trying to um, create from the White House's perspective? You know, one of the challenges is political reporters talking about military issues, you know, so you have to reach out to your military folks. What should I be asking? I mean, a lot of times I wouldn't even know like economics or business. I have no idea how people cover that. I have no interest and no aptitude for any of that. I can't balance a checkbook. So if I'm going to do it, I'm not going to do an economic story, but if I were to ask a question, I would go to our economics people. 
Um, so you really should go to the military people. And also, you're not going to get any, you know, I know we've known Kirby a long time. He's a great guy. You know, he's not going to tell you anything from the podium, right? Hopefully, there'll be a backgrounder. And this is where, you know, covering the military, you not only go to the Hill, the retired community. Those guys love to talk once they're retired, especially four stars, because they're chomping at the bit. The guy that took my job, he's doing an awful job. You know, I, I was so much better at that. Like a Petraeus, those guys, they can't stop talking, right? About Ukraine, about, and so forth. If someone's gonna get a promotion, let's say to become the next chairman of the Joint Chiefs, let's say he's an Air Force guy, talk to the Air Force retired community. They'll have a lot to say. Maybe not on the record, but you get a better sense of that. Embassies. People don't reach out to the embassies enough, right? There are some countries leaning forward on Ukraine much more than this country is. Those people like to talk. What are you hearing? What are those, what are the American guys saying to you? What are the other countries saying? Spain is basically saying now it's time to negotiate. Anybody else out there thinking of negotiating? Well, Hungary, yeah, it's kind of, a, yeah. But, you know, if this counteroffensive isn't successful, and how do you measure success, then what? This is where the embassies can come in, particularly the Brits and the Germans now. Hi, I'm Riley. I'm the DC correspondent with the Anchorage Daily News. Riley. So I'm curious to hear about your experience reporting that story about spies in Alaska. Um, how did you come about that? Well, I can't reveal too many trade secrets. <laughs> but um, it, it came about when I was covering suicide up there, right? And I talked to a lot of the officers and enlisted people about what life was like on that base. And it came up in conversation with a couple different um, officers and senior enlisted folks that this was happening and that I needed to look at it. But they only talked to me because I had been writing about suicide and exposing problems that the command there, top command, would rather we not write about. And you know what the public affairs folks are like there. They're not very good, right? <laughs> they never want to talk about it. So one of these guys tipped me off to it. I went back to several officers whose cell phones I got. That's also a tip, right? Whenever you're out, get somebody's cell phone. Always. You know, get cell phone numbers. Email's great, but they're not going to respond to email, um, especially on a military email. They're not going to tell you anything about it, but their cell phones, they would, right? And Signal, they, everybody loves Signal. You guys are, I'm sure, well-versed in that, but it's a way that uh, military folks are much more comfortable chatting with you about. So a young captain told me about this. I went to a senior officer at the base. He went as, and I had developed a relationship with him. He trusted me enough, and that's the other thing. It, these all are relationships based on trust, right? Nobody's gonna tell you something if they think you're gonna burn them on it, right? They're gonna, they have to know that you're gonna use the information responsibly. And that's not gonna come back and bite them in the ass because with spies, all of that stuff gets classified just like that. There's only so much they can talk about, almost nothing really. But they can say, they can talk about incidents, right? And what happened, but nothing beyond that, right? So that's, that's how I got on that story, confirmed it with a number of uh, different soldiers up there <laughs> and then with the help of somebody around here, I was able to talk to Department of Justice about what was going on. I was able to get, you guys know what a steer is, right? Okay, so if you've got a really sensitive story and you're worried about it and you want to make sure that you're right and that you're not going to embarrass yourself or your paper or whatever <laughs> your news organization is, you talk to people who know what's going on and you say, look, this doesn't have to be for the record. You don't have to be my source on this. But if I publish this, is it going to bite me in the ass? Is it going to make us look bad, right? This has to be somebody at a level who knows what's going on. Preferably, you'd want them to be a source for you, but it doesn't always happen that way. But mainly what you want is for them to say, <laughs> if I report this, are we going to be wrong, right? And I got, a, I got a steer from somebody at a high level at another agency about it. Others in the Pentagon said, yeah, you're not going to get burned by it. But that took weeks to do. Because you need to, in a, in a story like that, you can't just, it had to be entirely sourced, right? Nobody's on the record with it. And I went to the Hill as well. But even the Hill didn't know about it because they hadn't been briefed about it. 
and most of that stuff was classified. When you get to that point, that's when you need these higher level sources to be able to steer you in the right way. But that's what I mean by a steer. You know, along those lines, it reminds me there was a, a shoot down of a Chinook helicopter, those big bus sized helicopters in Afghanistan. This is after bin Laden had been killed by SEAL Team 6. And I think AP was reporting that, you know, they were all, all aboard were killed, that this is the same SEAL Team 6 that killed bin Laden. So AP runs this little thing. And of course, my desk calls. And we have a uh, newscast that runs every half hour. So they call and said, hey, can you confirm this? We want to go with it, like, in five minutes. So I called a particular person. I said, listen, we know it was shot down by an RPG. We know they're SEAL Team 6. Were these the same guys that got bin Laden? And this person said, I can't get into it. Let me tell you something. We're going to go with what AP says, and 14 million people are going to hear that. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Tom, I'd stay away from it. That's it. I mean, Not true. and that's that's why you need to. I mean, you develop these sources over over years. I'm sure in Tom's case, but but those are the. That's what you need. You need people that you can trust and that trust you enough to be able to tell you, stay away from it. Hi, I'm um, Jillian with McClatchy in Sacramento. Um, I'm curious, when we were at the Pentagon, one of the spokespeople told us that sometimes you coordinate on judgment calls when it comes to safety, uh, personal safety of someone for delaying a story, um, putting off a story in order to, um, you know, because a mission is ongoing or someone is at risk. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you've ha experienced that, um, how you make those judgment calls, if you're writing something that's sensitive that might impact something that's going on um, here overseas? Good question. Um, I will say, and Tom knows this source, I won't say who it is, has, t has told me time and again, this is a, a senior official, now retired, that there hasn't been one story that he's seen in his entire career, and he's been around a long time, that would have endangered um, a mission or public safety, and that that's way overblown. Um, and I can only think of one time that I was persuaded to not run a, run a story. It was early on when I was covering the Iraq war and it was about some particular form of IED that the Pentagon was saying if we reported it, the insurg it would give the insurgents uh, a clue about the vulnerability of vehicles. And we waited on it. In, in retrospect, I wish we hadn't because there's no way the insurgents didn't already know that. I mean, there were they knew more than the Pentagon did because they were blowing the stuff up every day. So I think that's way overblown. And I would be, I'd be shocked if that happens on a regular basis. It's rare to happen at the Pentagon. It's not that rare to happen in the field. You know, a lot of time in Afghanistan, and I had this general talk to me about an operation they, had, they were planning, this is 2009, into the Helmand River Valley, but it wasn't gonna happen for two more months. And he explained exactly how they're going to do it. But I knew this guy so well. I said, okay, when can, on what date can we actually do something on morning edition? Maybe we're all things considered. So we worked it out almost to the hour. But he, again, he trusted me enough. I don't think I would have told me, frankly. Yeah. It, it's just too risky. And I only told my editor, I didn't tell anybody else. And everyone's pissed because why don't you tell us? Because you're going to tell someone else. And I'm not going to do that. I don't give a shit what you think. So it all worked out well. We had our people in place when it happened. But again, you're not going to report on an, uh, an operation that's going to get people killed. Oftentimes, you're going with them. So they would say, Tom, we know you're not going to report it because you're going with us. You know, we don't want to alert the Taliban or ISIS or whoever. Um, but yeah, it's rare that, you know, you would have to withhold something that somebody said at the Pentagon. When the war began, the invasion began with Ukraine. I did get a sense. I was walking down the hallway with this guy, and we had our people in Ukraine. A friend of mine, Frank Lankford, was in Odessa. So I'm walking down the hallway with this guy, just saying, yeah, you know, we get a guy in Odessa. He stops me and says, get him out now. And this guy's like laid back, and I'm like, whoa. He said, I think it's going to happen tonight. I'm like, shit. So I called Frank on his cell. He was in Odessa at a hotel. I said, Frank, first of all, stick your microphone out the window tonight when you go to sleep because you're going to get some sweet sound in the morning. 
And secondly, you might want to think about going to Moldova. He said, it's fun. it sounds like a joke. He said, funny, I just talked to a rabbi who has three buses going to Moldova tomorrow. I said, you might want to get on bus three. And sure enough, it happened that night. He did get some sweet sound of jets flying over and everything. It all worked out well. But that was different, you know. And, and I would just say there is, there is occasionally, like when there's a, this happens every now and again, like there's a missile strike that's planned for Syria. Sometimes we'll get a heads up about that stuff on, on the condition that we don't report it right away. And that's, right. or, or that people happens. will say things like, don't go anywhere tonight. Right. I mean, that's always a nice sign. Yeah, you do get that. Hi, my name's uh, James, I'm with uh, Fox. I cover a little bit of the national security and part of the Pentagon from time to time. I kind of wanted to go back to what you were talking about earlier about everyone sort of lying to you and sort of directly lying to your face, especially in the building. You know, going back to sort I, of- I wouldn't say lying, I would say sugarcoating or putting the best face on something, like the Afghan army is getting better every day, that kind of thing. As far as direct lies, I, that, I, I think it's that's probably. I mean, people have lied on my my podcast. <laughs> people have clearly lie. Well, no question. Well, going to like you know things you know when the cigar report came out and all yeah. the reporting came in and you hear these things about you know commanders, everyone saying one some things in private, but then going out and putting a very different public face on it. And I was wondering if that's sort of has affected the way that you kind of look at those relationships in the Pentagon, affected the way that you guys try to do your reporting in terms of understanding and hearing maybe some of these people that you were covering were saying one thing in private and then going completely in a different direction in terms of public and going to public trust and everything like that. You know, oftentimes it would be more nuanced at the Pentagon or public, you know, a press conference, let's say Kabul, they would say, you know, this is going on, that's going on. Privately, they would have a little more negative view. So you kind of have to put it all in the mix, I think. Um, but it's it, it has been a problem over the years about people. I would say, you know, lying is probably too strong, but putting the best face on it, I think, is probably a better way to put it. Um, and then sometimes they wouldn't talk, you know, like uh, Karzai's brother, Ahmed Wali, who was, you know, mobbed up with the, the Taliban selling drugs and all. A lot of times they wouldn't even talk about it. But privately they would say, yeah, guy's a crook. No question, you know. But the administration didn't want to do anything about it. Another topic in terms of the Russia-Ukraine war, you know, specifically with that, there was before in the lead up, and I was remember being in the building, there was a lot of information given out, especially, you know, on background to reporters and stuff that I could tell was not usual in terms of the way they give out information. Was that something that was unusual, the detail, the amount of intelligence that was shared, and that was, could we theoretically expect that still going forward, or do you see that as sort of a one-time thing? You know? No, they gave out so much to classified information, it was stunning. Um, I talked to one guy at the Pentagon, he said, we knew more about what the Russians were doing than their own ground commanders. We gave the Ukrainians so much detailed intel about exactly where the Russians were, and to this day, they still do. Um, yeah, for them to come out publicly and talk about it, just to stick it to Putin, that's what it was all about, shake them up a little bit. But that's highly unusual. But they did think it was, uh, Kiev was going to fall in three days. We were told that, and the whole country would be rolled up to the Carpathian Mountains in three to four weeks. And then they thought it would be a serious guerrilla war that would go on for years. They had no idea this was going to happen. You can't predict it because you can't predict what the other side is going to do, right? I mean, go back to the Civil War, the first battle of Bull Run, right? You know, members of Congress and their families went and had picnics out there because they thought the federal troops were going to rout the South and it would be over in one battle. Didn't happen that way. And this counteroffensive, what's going to happen? Nobody knows. No one. Nobody. And it's also, just very quickly, it's also tight, completely tightened up now. You're not seeing that kind of information flow now. Ukrainians aren't telling them much. Ukrainians are being really tight-lipped, even with the Americans. Again, the U.S. knows more about what Russia is doing than Ukraine, which is really, really unusual. And also, thank God, there are reporters on the ground everywhere. The New York Times has been really intrepid. I mean, you only have so much luck. 
This is more dangerous than Iraq or Afghanistan or Syria by far. You don't want to be anywhere where people are dropping shells, missiles. You might as well not even wear your, your helmet and, and vest. It's not going to help you. It's not. I was going to ask a little bit more because you mentioned about, you know, just going to people and talking to them. But how has like social media and the Internet changed that for you now that you can see troops and, you know, just regular day to day soldiers talk about homophobia or sexism within the military? Like, how do you incorporate that into your reporting? And also, you know, seeing clips and videos of people in war zones, like how do you use that in order to make your stories better? Or, or is it, you know, complicating your reporting, too? I don't think it necessarily complicates it, but you can only use it as a tip sheet, right? I mean, you don't know who's really behind that stuff. So you, everything has to be verified and you've got to contact that person to make sure that they're authentic. So it helps. I mean, you, you may make the assumption that everything is as it seems, but you can't know that. And you've got to be really careful with it. Um, you go back to yesterday, right, when this F-16 sonic boom happened and there was a tweet that it was an exercise over Chesapeake Bay. And a lot of people went with that. You know, obviously that wasn't the case. So that's just an example of it. You just got to be super careful about it. It's helpful because you everybody's got a voice now, right? The, you know, private whatever Smith can pipe off about anything. She, she'll probably get in trouble about it if it's if it's sensitive. But um, you can see stuff that way. It, it is helpful. But all there, it's a double edged sword. You know, social media, it, there's more places to look now and more things to chase down. It can be helpful, but oftentimes it's a tip sheet. And also, what are we seeing on social media from supposedly eastern Ukraine? Is that really eastern Ukraine or is it, you know, Poland? Someone's on a, you know, in, in these uh, vehicles that were used crossing into Russia. There's all sorts of reports. Were they MRAPs, US MRAPs? Were they old Polish stuff? What is it? I think the Times did a story saying they believe they were MRAPs, but um, right. trying to get to the bottom of that, it can be difficult. And again, if you're, you know, some soldier or Marine, you know, basically talks about homophobia or this or that. I mean, it's, it's always a good reach out to that person. Who are you? Are you really a soldier or Marine? What base are you at? I mean, is there anyone else we can reach out to at the base to talk with about this? Go out to the base again. You're not paying for it. The organization is. It's always good to get out of town. Um, I mean, clearly, you know, the military, from what I've seen over the years, it's clearly in some areas homophobic. It's a very conservative organization. Some of the things I've heard say about gay people, about women, you, you just can't believe it. It's like, this is the 21st century. What? You know, but the, the, the military tends to come from a more conservative part of the country. You're going to hear some of that stuff. Is it rampant or extremists, you know, rising in, in numbers in the military? Possibly. How do you get your handle on that? Um, it's still an ongoing, interesting and good story. Hey, Kirsten Garris with Cox Media Group, and I'm actually a big NPR fan, so cool to put a voice to a face. <laughs> um, but I have two questions. What has been your, I guess, most challenging assignment overseas? And then, I mean, I was a local reporter for eight years, so I've seen some tough crime scenes. But how, I mean, I can't imagine covering a war or being in a war zone. How do you almost take that step back? How do you handle your mental health knowing you've seen things that none of us, you know, many of us haven't seen? I mean, again, you're only reporting, but so much you saw things that maybe you can't even report. So just how do you kind of take care of your mental health covering this kind of stuff all the time? It's a really good question. Tom has much more overseas experience than I have. Um, I've been to Iraq and Afghanistan and other places. I guess the toughest thing Mm. I'm trying to think of what the toughest thing would be. And frankly, the tough, the toughest stuff is, is, is for me has been reporting on suicide here because I, I talk to um, families, mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, the folks around them. That's been really hard to, um, to stomach sometimes. Um, and you just, it helps in a way to talk to relatives of grieving, folks who are grieving because they really want the story of this person to come out. So there's some benefit to me in, in doing that, into talking to people. You feel like you're giving them a voice or giving this person who's gone a voice. Um, and that's, to me, the, been one of the more challenging things, but rewarding too. And I guess you just have to, um, you know, lean on your family, walk your dog. 
that kind of stuff. You know, know that there's there are good things in the world. It's not all bad. You have to step away from it as much as you can. I'm Boston Irish, so I tend to be very stoical. <laughs> and people say, do you ever get any help? I'm like, what are you talking about? So at any rate, um, there have been a number of incidents that are frankly surreal. You know, roadside bombs blowing up um, a vehicle, two people killed. I don't want to get too graphic, but it, not much left. And you're just like, I'm in a dream. I'm in a weird war movie. It's just bizarre. And the worst was actually seven years ago today, we lost our photographer, David Gilkey, and our interpreter in an ambush in Afghanistan. We were foolishly with the Afghan army uh, in an ambush. Doctrine says when you're in an ambush, you don't stop. You just push through. These knuckleheads stop and start shooting back at the Taliban. Our guys got hit with an RPG. We took small arms fire. My producer sitting behind me, she said, Tom, I'm really scared. Don't worry about it. Not a problem. We were in an armored vehicle and um, our friends were killed. And we were told initially, no, they just got a flat tire. They'll be coming back to the base. And they brought in the vehicles and they popped the back and there's our interpreter killed. And my producer just, I was more worried about her than anything. He was dead, and then they brought in the photographer, and he was dead as well. So that was, it's still, I still can't believe it. Um, all that being said, you can't cover this stuff unless you go there. You really have to be careful, though. Um, I worry more about the people in Ukraine. I mean, they've lost a lot of people. Um, the best part, of, well, the best part, I mean, talk about mental health and all, I think the best thing we did after that happened, we stayed in a, at an American base for like another week just to decompress rather than immediately coming home. I think that helped a lot. So you're just with each other, talking it out. That helps a lot. But um, just before we left, I was with a photographer. We were in Alexandria with this Green Beret colonel. He said, I'm not going to be tell you to be safe where you're going. You can't be safe. Just be careful. Um, and you real I, I think he's right. You really have to be careful. There are certain things you probably, that are too dangerous to do. And in hindsight, going with the Afghan army was probably a little too dangerous. We did it the year before and it seemed to be okay. So I thought it'd be okay again. But you're covering a war and anything could happen. <clears throat> you could be sitting in Kiev at a cafe have your cup of coffee and another guy's on the front line. You get hit by a missile. He's just eating lousy food with the Afghan troops or the uh, Ukrainian troops. But um, you have to, people have to go and cover it. But what is your comfort level? I remember in Iraq, uh, we lived, we were in a safe house. We would go from the airport with our guards to the safe house. And then we would fly out to the various parts of the country. There was this big burly guy for CNN, cameraman. He would never leave the house. Just said, I'm just going to stay here and do stand-ups with you folks. I have nothing against this guy at all. It's like, what is your comfort level? Some people take far too many risks. And again, you only have so much luck. Something bad is going to happen. But every, each person has to weigh that. What What is my comfort level? Hi, I'm Matthew Troy with the Texas Tribune. Um, that actually answered a lot of the, my question. It was about how do you assess risk and what you, how do you determine what your threshold it is? Is it entirely individualized? Um, well, in our case, because of what happened to us, they're really risk averse now in Ukraine. They really don't let them go many places. Um, we're so risk averse that we're not covered the January 6th thing. This is when that was going to be a speech with you know, 20,000 people. They said, okay, Tom, we want you to wear a bike helmet, your vest, and carry a gas mask. I'm like, yeah, okay. I wore my jeans, my leather jacket. I already had COVID. My darling daughter brought it back from UVA. <laughs> Do you really think I'm going to go up there to a Trump rally with a bike helmet and a vest and a gas mask and a mask on, COVID mask? Really? Why don't I just hit myself with a baseball bat right now? <laughs> so... I think it, it, our organization, again, 
because of what happened is, is little more risk averse. But it, mostly it's a personal issue, I think. What can I do? You, you, if you're going to go overseas, you go to a place like Ukraine, you really need a good fixer. Can we go to this town? And the, this person, whoever it is, is going to know that place a thousand times more than you. Is going to say, no, we're not going to that town. It's like, okay, got it. Where, where can we go? If Zaporizhia is going to be sort of the, uh, the pushing off point for this counteroffensive, how close can we get? Those are the kind of questions you want. Um, but also, you don't have to necessarily go to Zaporizhia and watch them mount their offensive. You know, who are the wounded guys? You can talk to them in Kiev. Who are the Russian prisoners? Not, you know, the Times and the Post have done stories on that. You, you can never do enough of those. What do the Wagner guys group say? Wouldn't you like to talk to a Wagner guy that got wounded in Bakhmut? They're, you know, probably sitting in a prison uh, camp in Lviv or these uh, military guys, these wounded guys in a hospital in Kiev. You can get a lot of stuff talking to these guys. Compelling stories without putting yourself at risk. A couple things I'd add. Make sure that your organization is fully behind you when you, when you make a decision to go like that. And talk to your colleagues at other organizations like the Times. They'll talk to you about it, about what you need to stay safe, right? Don't, don't assume that your company has your back because they may not know what that means. So make sure that you have fixers and security, whatever level you need to make you feel comfortable before you do it. Um, really don't take unnecessary risks. As Tom said, your luck is going to run out fast if you don't. So you got to mitigate that as much as you can. And frankly, don't talk to your control. You have to talk to your bosses in Washington right. or LA, wherever they are. They don't know anything right. about Ukraine. That 25 year old fixer that's born and raised in Ukraine, I would listen to that person. Right. If that person says, it's safe. I think we can go here. I would listen to that person that sent some idiot editor back in the States that is never, that never gets out of his office. Yeah, yeah the, the risk, you're, you're the one who's, well, yeah, you're the one who's ultimately responsible for it. And you're responsible for, if you're chasing a story for the folks you're around here, your translator and your fixer. So don't, you can't take chances with their lives either. So you got to be really careful of that stuff. Hi, I'm Jackie. I'm with CQ Roll Call. Um, I was wondering, you said earlier uh, something about how, like, you work for the White House, you only know, like, 30% of the story. You work for the Pentagon, you only you know even less. And that's always something that's fascinated me about, like, defense reporting, intelligence agency reporting, is, like, how much of it is just unknowable. And it felt like kind of an existential thing. Like, how do you deal with that, knowing that? so much of your beat is something that you can never really chip away at. And are there areas of the, the defense beat of the Pentagon beat where you have like, that's your dream to break open that story? I don't, I don't know that I, I, I think things are unknowable. I mean, it depends. It, it all comes down to your sources, right? I mean, there's, when it comes to the intelligence stuff that we were talking about, about spying, it's all knowable, but it's its just the degree of difficulty, right? And and it's, it comes down to de developing relationships with people who know stuff. And the only way you do that is to not bug them when the story's happening, but to develop that relationship beforehand. So as Tom said, you know, whoever it is, if it's on the Hill and you're working on Intel, you go to the Intel com committees, but, but talk to those people before you want to do a story. You know, go have coffee with them, cut, you know, an hour out of your day to go talk to somebody so that they know who you are, they know what you work on, what you cover, and that they trust you a little bit, you know, that they can, they know what you're, who you are, what your face is when you're calling them on the phone so that you can, you know, develop a rapport that allows you to start breaking stories. And also, you, again, this gets back to, you, ha you can never have enough sources. It's the hill. It's if you're overseas, you want to talk to the, the foreign government or NGOs. Uh, I'm just thinking about um, uh, civilian casualties. That's a continuing big story. You know, the story about the May 3rd airstrike. They thought they killed an Al-Qaeda leader. It's definitely not an Al-Qaeda leader. They, don't, they haven't said who it is. Um, we expect that in a week or two. But 
the, the Syrian uh, human rights folks are very good to keep in touch with Doctors Without Borders. What happened in this situation? Um, there was a famous incident in Afghanistan in Kunduz where they actually hit a hospital, killed a lot of people. I mean, that still has not all come out exactly what happened. It was a huge screw up. Um, I'm told there's an investigative report that's classified. But again, this is where you talk to the Hill, you talk to others. Is there any way we can get that uh, classified report? Something else that's classified too, the, the Taliban agreement signed by the Trump administration had a, a, a number of secret codicils. Why are they still secret? Anybody cover the White House here? Why don't you ask him? <laughs> ask Kirby, why is that still secret? What did they, what did they agree to? One of the best kept, I could be completely wrong, um, are the security of the supply lines uh, to the Ukrainian forces. Is, is that accurate? And, and is, is that one of the things that it, it, you know, sort of borders on the unknowable at, at the moment? You no, know, the supply lines are really secure, which is highly unusual. Because you know where the rail lines are. I was talking to a retired general. He said, he said um, Ray Charles could find that railroad. Why can't the Russians? Uh, it, I think it's because they, they have a lack of precision weapons. But they haven't hit much at all. They did slightly damage one of the Patriot systems. It seems to be working. But, yeah, I think part of it is they just don't have precision weapons. They don't have the eyes on that you would need to destroy someone else's logistics. We're seeing the Russians get hit pretty hard now. Their rail lines, their fuel depots, pushing into Belgorod, hitting Moscow. You're seeing a lot more of that going on. This is all shaping activities to destroy someone's logistics. It doesn't matter how many troops you have. If they don't have water, they don't have food and weapons and ammunition. I guess the proof of that, too, is that everything's getting through, right? I mean. Hi, I'm Janae with C-SPAN. Um, just some quick questions. What are something we've talked a lot about, like Ukraine and Russia, but what are some other national security issues or defense issues that maybe keep you all up that don't get as much attention as they should? Well, obviously, you've got to think about China, right, and what's going on in Taiwan. There's a reason that we're sending them billions of dollars in arms every year. And China makes no bones about the fact that it wants Taiwan. Um, how likely is that? I mean, we hear varying accounts from um, people supposedly in the know at the Pentagon about it, that it could be just a matter of years, right? That would be incredibly bloody, and we're committed to their defense. So I think that rises right to the top of the list. No, I agree. China is you know, the outstanding issue, for, will it be for many, many years to come. It'd be great if you can go to Taiwan, see what they're doing as far as training, get out on the fast patrol boats out in the, you know, the uh, Taiwan Straits. Um, I'm told, and this would be a great story, I've been pushing this, somebody can maybe pick it up if you get a free trip to Taiwan, that the civilian defense force, they've increased their amount of time from I think six months to a year. Um, it's, I think it's compulsory military service. One of the things they're doing is the uh, eastern part of Taiwan. I've only been to the airport once on my way to somewhere else. The eastern part of the country is very mountainous. They are training these troops to go up into the mountain passes and take the passes. Kind of like Thermopylae, you know, 300. Um, I said, damn, I would love to tell that story. That's a great story. So, um, yeah, there are so many things to do about Taiwan, what kind of weaponry they're getting, what kind of training, what kind of defenses are they building up? Um, will China do it? I don't know. Depends who you talk to. Um, another thing is the future of Russia. They've lost half of all their tanks, a third of all their armored personnel carrier, at least 250,000 casualties. What is the future of that military? I, I think that's absolutely fascinating. And now with Finland joining NATO, that's more of a threat. Um, I was talking to a Marine general. He said, Tom, I could take a battalion of Marines right now and walk to Moscow. All their troops are in Ukraine 
or outside of Ukraine. That's a great ongoing story. What's the future of Russia? It's kind of a temperature check, but there's this whole Tuberville holding back all these military promotions. And should we be, I, I, I have had to cover that a lot just because of statements get put out and, you know, they have all this stuff going on about it. But how much more air should we be giving to that? Do you think it actually will have a very measurable impact if it continues happening? Or, you know, what are your thoughts on that situation overall? I'm sorry, what is it? Tuber uh, Tuberville holding the Tuberville. promotions. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's clearly a stunt on his part, right? But it's, and the impacts that they point to are families can't go to their next posts, right? Commanders who are, you know, stuck in these positions are reluctant to make decisions that are going to hamstring the person who's coming in to replace them. So they're, they're a little nebulous, right? I mean, there is a reason that these things are supposed to happen. I, he's, not, he's not threatening to gum up the very top, like the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I, it's, I think you have to report it, but I, I don't think you want to overblow it because that's all he's looking for is a lot of attention. I just don't think it's that interesting. Yeah, well, it's not either. No, it's not. I'm just curious, have you all had any like foreign nationals or anyone reach out to you um, that maybe was a little bit suspicious? Uh, more sus suspicious for me is for Navy criminal investigators to reach out to me to try to um, uh, know who my sources are. I'm more, much more worried about that, and that's happened a few times. Uh, same with the Army. Um, as soon as I wrote the story about the spies in the Army, I was followed by the Army Counterintelligence uh, Command. So I worry, I worry more about that because people tell you stuff in confidence that, you know, could presumably put them in jail, right? If they're giving you classified information. So I'm much more worried about what's happening here than I am about any foreign nationals. Uh, I have been nothing. Um, I cover the Senate and on Capitol Hill, sometimes it can be hard to overlook the Tuberville stunts or the Chinese spy balloons or the funding issues um, when it comes to international problems or uh, national security. Are there any issues that you guys are keeping an eye on from a health per perspective that you could see bubbling up this year outside of Russia and Ukraine or China and Taiwan that you think for us on the Hill we should be paying attention to? I would hit them hard about why they think the Pentagon needs all this money um, and that they're going to be held apart from this budget deal and that there are going to be supplemental bills for it. They're you go back not that many years and we had, you know, 150, 200,000 troops deployed. There aren't any troops deployed right now. So why do they need all of this money? And they have continually, you know, they're going to be, there's going to be a supplemental if they don't get 3% plus. Why? Why? Where is all that money going? They can't audit themselves. They don't know where, they don't know where that money's going. I would be just have my nose to the ground on where this money's going. Oh, it's, it was funny. I was just talking with a fellow reporter at the Pentagon today about this, Tony Capazio from Bloomberg, who knows more about the budget than anybody in the whole Pentagon. And we were talking about the supplemental. We both agreed it's a public works project, what it is. Where's that money going? Somebody knows where the money's going, and they'll have to you know, list it where it's going. You know it's going to go mostly, I think, to red states, to build another ship in Pascagoula, right? And then you go up to that senator and congressman and say, I thought you were worried about the deficit and reducing spending. The Navy didn't even want this ship. Why, you, why do you think you need a ship? Right? Is this a public works project? People don't stick it to politicians enough. They just, they just don't. They ask easy questions. Are you, are you close to an agreement on the debt limit? We're working it. Now. I mean, it's just, you know. The great thing about being a reporter is to stick it to people. <laughs> One of the great things about it. Because if you're not going to ask the hard questions, if you're not going to hold their feet to the fire, why are we even doing it? Go get a real job. There's this particular general that I knew in Af I don't want to mention names because he would know who he is. No, I really, I really can't. If this were, you know, Chatham House rules, I would. So I just got back from Helmand Province, running around with the Marines, and he said, when you get back to Kabul, I want you to come see me because... When you go places, you know, you see things that, you know, I can't see. Because when a four-star shows up, 
It's like the papal visit. It's like everything's great, everything's wonderful. You know, you've been doing this long enough, you know it looks right. I said, great, come back. Throws his staff out, rolls down the map. Says, okay, where'd you go? Went here, what's it look like? It's a piece of shit. This is really bad. This place is kind of somewhere in the middle. This place in the north, no one even goes there. It's awful. I said, yeah, yeah. And over here, he said, this, we're working on this, we're a little worried about this. It's like the whole map, right? So he, this guy said, have you gone to see uh, Abrams? Abe Abrams, who retired now, and a four-star. He, he ran Korea. He was a commander in Korea. His dad was Creighton Abrams, who, if you any of her study history, was one of the last commanders in Vietnam, a famous guy in World War II for relieving Bastogne during the Battle of the Bulge. Patton said he was the best tank commander I ever knew. So I go to see this guy. And I said, I don't know him, but I know the name. We sit down, me and my producer. And immediately the guy says, you guys are too negative about Afghanistan. Everything is great here. You know, you keep in the negative story. I said, we were just in hell mind. He said, uh, listen, listen, everything is great here. You guys are all negative. And this is it's like a fire hose. And I'm like, wow. And finally I said, I got kind of pissed. And again, you're a reporter. What are they going to do to me? Right? Court martial me? What the worst thing you can do? So finally I had enough. They said, how many times you've been to Afghanistan? He said, uh, it's my first time. Really? Well, I've been coming here for 10 years. And what you're saying makes no sense. It kind of went downhill from there. <laughs> so his public affairs guy is sitting there like this. I thought his head was going to spin around. Um, he's in the Pentagon now as a full colonel. It's uh, Roger oh. Cabinet. We still laugh about it. But, um, you know, again, you don't have to take this from anybody. Right? Lawmakers, generals, colonels, I don't care who they are. You have to ask the right question. It's hard to run the hill because they're so polished. They're so ready to give you gruel and they think you're going to accept it. Right? Be harder on all of them. Um, two quick questions just about your opinions on the storyline about military readiness for a China Taiwan you know, conflict after Ukraine because there's like that storyline that a lot of, um, you know, supplies are low, et cetera, from the U.S. side. And then the other question I had is uh, we have like Republican primaries heating up already. There's a lot of rhetoric about the military. I mean, what sort of politicization of the military do you foresee? What spin are Republicans putting out there that, you know, a political reporter should be aware of? As far as the readiness for China, and I, I make no bones about being an expert about it, but the weaponry would be almost entirely different than what you're seeing in Ukraine. It's Now it's artillery and armored vehicles. It'd be anti-ship missiles, um, fighter jets. So it's I, I, the readiness issue probably isn't, isn't the same thing. Um, and as far as Republicans politicizing the military, um, well, you're seeing it with Tuberville and nobody's really, that's made a tiny, tiny ripple, I don't, you know, and there's stuff about the woke military gets knocked down quickly. Um, if you go and talk to troops about that stuff, they don't care. I mean, it's, it is not on their list of concerns at all about the, you know, what's being taught in, in, in schools, in military schools. It just, it, it's of no consequence to them at all. I agree with all that. Okay, um, I wanted to ask about, um, you were mentioning that, you know, an invasion of Taiwan according to some estimations, could come within the next couple of years. Um, what if your newsroom's done to prepare for that possibility? Are they investing in a robust Taipei bureau that will be really like knowledgeable about the country if and when that ever happens? What's that kind of looking like? Well, we haven't done anything, so I'm going to pass the time. <laughs> no, we have a reporter based in Taiwan, and we talk occasionally about the story. I told her about the hills and mountain passes they say but you got to do that story or i'll do it um we talk about the weaponry that's heading there we have backgrounders with uh, pacific commanders about if this happens what would it look like which is absolutely fascinating it's very difficult for china to pull this off they would have to own the entire taiwan strait uh under sea on the water and in the air own it 100 percent. that's really hard to do and the ukraine invasion might be instructive for them, showing how difficult it would be. They're talking about the porcupine strategy for Taiwan. Um, 
this is why the cruise missiles, the attack craft, mines, because, you know, you would have to land your assault uh, ships just like Normandy invasion, which is tomorrow, the anniversary. It's really, it's the most difficult military operation there is, landing troops on a beach because the defenders have sway. China has, you know, it's obviously, you can never beef up Taiwan enough, probably, to, you know, you can make it really difficult for China if do they decide to do it or not do it. Most people think in two years, they'll be ready to do it. Now, will they do it or not do it? Nobody knows, no one. Um, yeah, but you know, we're, we're focused on it. It's, but it's one of those things that's like, will they, won't they? I don't know. How much stuff are you gonna send them? Then you have Pelosi going over, you have all these other guys going over, and then China starts doing what China does, you know. The big question is when and would and when the U.S. get involved. And you could see it if there's some sort of a blockade around Taiwan, which is what they practiced in the last round when they had a, a congressional delegation going there. That could get really interesting fast um, because the U.S. would maybe want to break the blockade. And a blockade itself is an act of war. So then what? What do you do? That would be absolutely fascinating. But uh, we'll see what, you know, you talk to some people, it's like, oh yeah, they're definitely gonna do it. And other people, it's like, no, no, makes no sense. I wanna thank both of these guys for reminding us how important it is to get out for the office and how much fun this job can really be when you do it and you meet uh, the folks who really mean something. So thanks very much. Thank you.